Hey folks, Steve here, and let's talk Shine. If you don't like Shine, you may want to call the doctor and get your heart checked because it may not be working. My point being that Shine is a very, uh, very moving film, a very poignant film, a very deep film about. Um, well, I mean, it's a you know, it's a tragic story in a way about this kind of child pianist genius who had a breakdown of which he never fully recovered and the film explores um, that uh, that journey that he goes on and the film did remarkably well um, both commercially and critically which I'll talk about in a second the most remarkable thing about the film is that it won an Academy Award for Jeffrey Rush, and that is pretty fucking phenomenal when you think about what the film's going up against. Hollywood generally, the Hollywood Academy, as in the Oscars, they only really give the awards to themselves, unless you're in the foreign film category, right? You're not really going to win, say, Best Actor for a foreign film, things like that, right? But Shine... One, like Jeffrey Rush won. So there goes the argument that an actor, an Australian actor, has to go overseas to work on a big Hollywood movie to win an Academy Award. Jeffrey Rush was so good in Shine, he won an Academy Award. And it's amazing when you think about it because this isn't what, like, the Jeffrey Rush that we know today, you know, the um, industry acclaimed and loved, uh, well, acclaimed. I don't know how loved he is within the industry. I don't know why he wouldn't be loved, but, you know, um, I don't want to sort of make any assumptions there. But he wasn't known, is my point here. Um, and they gave him the Academy. And generally, you know, how you win an Academy Award is you kind of wear down, you, you kind of wear down the Academy over a number of years in a number of films where they think, okay, finally, you know, you've earned your due and here's your, here's your Academy Award. Um, but that didn't happen with Jeffrey Rush. He does his film. It's like his first proper feature film. He'd been in a couple very tiny parts. He does this starring role. Um, he was, you know, he was he was sort of known for being a, a theatre actor. So he does this film, um, and you know, he wasn't young. I think it was early forties when he did um, he did this film. Uh, well, you know, like. Early 40s, not that old, but um, not that young either. It's not like he was in his 20s, is my point here. Now, what we're looking at is uh, a couple of things. we got Jeffrey Rush in the Australian poster, and he's jumping... Well, he's in his... Um, he's, he's, na he's naked. He's naked, um, ladies and gentlemen, in this poster. And... Um, He's got headphones on. Now, now we, we'll all know this scene when we watch the film because we will see Jeffrey Rush on a trampoline uh, jumping up and down naked with his flasher jacket on. Not that um, the John Hill coat represented here is, um, you know, is a flasher, but he has got a flashing jacket. I guess if you, if you are a flasher, you need that sort of jacket. Um, to win, I think. Anyway, um, that's the poster. I don't, I don't know what, you know, what, what what do people think about the poster. I'm not. Um, I'm not entirely convinced. I'm not entirely convinced um, by the poster. It's not really doing much for me. Um, now, the English poster. So that's the one on. Um, that's one on the right hand side where Jeffrey. He's looking, um, you know, he's looking right at us in the, uh, you know, he's, he seems to be sitting amongst the clouds. But um, he's at a piano and uh, now Shine. The uh, the UK the UK release of Shine was huge 
um, as well. I haven't been able to find the box office for uh, for the UK numbers for Shine, but if you do find the numbers, um, let me know. But it did really well. did well at the box office and it won nine BAFTA awards. That's their version of uh, the AFI or the Actor Awards or their Academy um, Awards. And you can see the poster there. And then the one down the bottom, which is um, more perplexing, even though the S in Shine is um, a squiggly kind of musically uh, attached uh, symbol. And um, you've, got, uh, you've got no Jeffrey Rush in that image because Jeffrey Rush wasn't known. Noah Taylor, a little bit known, so they've got him in the poster. Anyway, they're the three posters um, about... Jeffrey Rush. And I think what all of the posters are saying is that this is a film about a character, you know, a particular character. So it's not a genre piece, which is interesting. And when a film isn't a genre piece, it's like, okay, well, how do we sell the film if we don't have a known star in the film, which is very difficult. So what you essentially do is you sell the film as introducing the actor, you know, introducing Jeffrey Rush, that from this film, Jeffrey Rush will be a star, right? Um, and you certainly have that around the press and the publicity for this film, that, you know, Jeffrey Rush will become a star based on this film and this performance. Now, um, Scott Hicks, he directed the film, and, um, I mean, he wasn't a, a first-time director, before he did this, he'd um, but after Shine, uh, he sort of made he's kind of continued to make um, atmospheric character study kind of movies, but uh, oh, look, uh, you know, I don't, he hasn't really done much um, that would really compete with Shine. Shine's kind of his best thing, um, maybe that's because of the script, I don't know, but um, all these films. Uh, good films on an aeroplane. Take, um, take, you know, make of that what you will. He's also done, uh, I'm only looking, The Best of In Excess. He did that in 2004. He did videos for Don't Change. This is a, uh, I, I remember that being a good film clip. Spy of Love. I didn't even know that was an In Excess song. And To Look At You. So there you go. Uh, he's done some in excess. And he, he did a documentary on Philip Glass. <laughs> Another troubled genius. And that's actually not too bad. Not great, but not too bad. All right, box office. So, uh, film killed it in the US. If you're going to win an Academy Award for Best Actor, you know the film's going to do well. So it won. Um, won. It made about uh, $38 million in the US. It's pretty good. Good business for a small independent Australian film. And in Australia, it made 10 million, which is great. It's a um, hugely successful film, um, you know, both domestically and internationally. So then it begs the question, why can a film like Shine do so well when uh, so many other films don't? And that's what I really want to concentrate on today. I want us to think about um, exploring these successful films and really trying to unpack them and not just say a film's successful because it's a fluke, but because of particular strategies and particular things that it's doing, um, but also the problems that um, come with that. Now, uh, I just want to talk through um, a couple of things that Andrew Pike says in one of the readings. So he works at Ronin Films and they distributed the film. Andrew Pike is a film historian uh, who um, who now distributes. You know, he's set up Ronin Films. So he do great things. Ronin Films, I like to celebrate Ronin Films. Uh, I think this film should, oh, sorry, this course should celebrate a company like Ronin Films, which is a fantastic company. They're really about um, the, the love and the interest for Australian cinema and they are often distributing films that don't get distribution anywhere else. So, um, Ronin Films, my hat, if I was wearing a hat, 
which I'm not, but if I was wearing a hat, my hat is off to you for the good service you're doing. And um, I would just encourage students of this course to um, go to the Ronin Films website and look at all the good things that they've been doing as far as distribution goes. All right, now a couple of quotes from him. Our first one, I often feel that the local film community and academic observers, I suppose that's that includes us, we're academic observers, aren't we, are overly preoccupied with the dire Australian share of the national box office gross. Is that true for us? Uh, maybe it is. We have endless studies of what is wrong and endless script writing workshops to try to fix the problems perceived in production. We get very little or no analysis of the occasions when something different happened, when certain Australian films took an unusually large share of the box office. And um, I think that's true. Other people have been um, doing similar things. Some, some have been um, academic observers like Deb Verhoeven. And uh, she wrote a very interesting piece in a film journal, which uh, you can get the online copy. It, uh, the film journal is called Studies in Australasian Cinema. And um, she, her, the article, article was called Measuring Success. And what the film, or what the article really does, is it looks at success through a number of different ways. And actually thinking about um, success in um, well, positive ways rather than kind of dismissing them. Because what often happens when a film's successful, it's like people say, oh, well, it's sold out because of the following reasons. Um, rather than just say, well, maybe the film just did really well. Um, and, y you know... I'm interested to know what people have to say about Shine and its success and why you think it did so well. Another quote from Andrew Pike. Because Shine is based on the lives of real people, we felt that media exposure of these real people needed to be managed carefully to avoid any chance of the film being seen as a dramatised documentary and especially to make sure that Russia's performance was never regarded as mimicking Health Coat's distinctive personality. So um, what happened with the Shine release is they, uh, they, they put the real David Healthcote on, under contract and uh, I think they allowed him to do four interviews and that's it. And all the rest, it was all about Jeffrey because it, it's interesting. What they were trying to do was sell Jeffrey as an actor, you know, as a screen actor, as somebody who could you know, portray really interesting characters and put them on the screen. And, um, you know, you certainly get that going on with this film. This isn't a film that kind of, it doesn't want to be known for being historically accurate. Although there is some historical accuracy going on, which I'll get to, um, the film is really about a performance. And think of other films like, uh, say, an Evil Angels. Oh, well, Evil Angels is more problematic because uh, you got Meryl just killing it as Lindy Chamberlain. Um, but, you know, Rabbit Proof Fans, you know, other films like that, which is more interested in the event that it's depicting. Shine is far more interested in depicting the character. It's not, a, it's not an event film. It's actually about an event. Like Evil Angels, the event is the dingo taking the baby. Or... Did the dingo take the baby? Well, the court would suggest that, yes, the dingo did take the baby. But in the 80s, everyone thought uh, the dingo didn't take the baby. I'm talking around in circles now about the dingo. All right, now this is interesting. Uh, Australian Classification Board. Now, um, uh, Andrew Pike, he, he wanted to distribute the film for one reason. He thought, oh, great, we'll put this film into high schools. We'll get all the school kids watching the film. We'll sell a few copies there. Get all the schools to buy copies. And uh, he said this, one of the reasons we initially signed up for Shine was because I felt it had excellent potential for secondary school audiences, an important ancillary market for us. So, um, I mean, you might want to think about that. You know, what films uh, have you seen as School students, uh, what Australian films have you seen? How have those films been taught? 
Uh, tell me about that. I'm very interested to have that conversation with you because I'm actually doing a project at the moment on uh, how Australian films are being taught in the classroom, in the secondary school classroom. So if you've got any stories, let me know. And uh, if you want to be quoted in my research, um, I can quote you. So there you go. Now, uh, they, they, hit, they hit a wall, as you, as you say, because they put the film into the Australian Classification Board, who have to rate every film. That's what they do. And uh, the, the rating came back with M, with an M rating, which was um, uh, M for mature audiences, which means, um, you know, not people under 16 can see the film, because uh, they said because of scenes of child abuse. And um, think about that. And, uh, I mean, there are, I mean, when, when you say child abuse, that sounds pretty haunting and damning and um you know some people might even say it's not child abuse you have a crazy father going on in this film and uh he wants his son to be uh the best pianist ever and he's willing to do anything to make sure that happens and uh, he pushes and he pushes and he pushes and as the film depicts he pushes him so hard uh david can't take it anymore and he just has a breakdown of which he never recovers so the first question how is this represented the father of the child abuse. I'll get to that in a sec because there were some ethical issues um, to do with the family that having a problem with the film. Um, and then what happened is um, they said, uh, you know, Ronan and others, they said, bullshit, this is not fair. This is not an M film. All right. I see, unlike a film like Chopper, which wants a bit of an R rating film, you know, give, give, give us the R rating certificate to prove that we're, we're cutting edge and tough. This film does not want an M rating because it's going to um, significantly diminish their box office. And um, you know, maybe a project that you could work on is um, how many you know box office for M rating films as opposed to PG rating films. Anyway, then they put it in again, and it came back uh, confusingly with a PG rating. Confusingly, because in Western Australia, they still said no, it's M. In Western Australia, we're going to call an M. So you've got you've got basically two classifications for the film. You've got M in Western Australia and PG in everywhere else in Australia. And then they went to the premiere in uh, Western Australia, and they said, "Come on, Jeffrey, he's killing it in this film. It's going to be great, huge success. Do you want to be known as the nanny state?" And the premier said, "No, I do not." So he pulled, he uh, he he overrid the classification board, and he put his own PG stamp on the film. So the film was given a PG rating, and thank goodness for that, because um, that would have been confusing, you know. On the movie poster, there were two um, things. Anyway, I thought that was quite interesting. Um, the you know the rating. Um, classification, Australian Classification Board. Now, that is an interesting project. Ida Bertrand, she wrote a book on the Australian Classification Board. Um, uh, I think I, I, I think it was called, exactly. But type in the name Ina, I-N-A, Bertrand, and um, you will find her book. Uh, something about censorship is in the title. Okay, now um, I'm kind of interested in the way Australian films have uh, received and perceived and accepted internationally and how they're reviewed and how audiences respond to them because how we respond to a, a film, an Australian film, is extremely different to how an international audience um, responds to the film. Now, in Australia, Australians love the film Australian critics love the film. Everybody fell in love with Jeffrey Rush. Thought he was just fantastic, right? Who is this old bastard? You know they're all saying Noah Taylor, who plays the young uh, David Helfgott. He, you know, he was also just proving his acting chops. And then the film went overseas, and of course, it did very well overseas. But critically, uh, it, it was it had more mixed responses. And um, I'm interested in uh, this uh, film quarterly review. Um, here are a couple of quotes 
director Scott Hicks stages almost every scene for its superficial dramatic worth. He rarely delves into the complexities of the material, preferring to skim the surface of its emotionalism and thematic implications. A supposedly bold work. Shine keeps too steady a course. Its central flaw lies in its reluctance to be anything more than just ordinary. Whew. Bit harsh, you may think. Uh, interested to know what you think about that. I mean, the thing about Shine, which I think is so amazing, is the film, like cinematically, you know, there are a lot more interesting, exciting films that I'd like to see. You know, like I said, I don't think Scott Hicks is a really a super director. But here is a film where the film gives itself to a performance and the performance being Jeffrey Rush. And Rush is so compelling on the screen that it's hard not to just fall in love with the world that Scott Hicks creates, which I suppose is a sign of a good director. You know, go with your strengths and the strength is in the performance. So I would say uh, with this review, um, you know, it might be a bit harsh because the film is actually about the performance. So um, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure, you know, um, how fair that is, but it's interesting to, um, you know, hear that response. And that response is, you know, quite common for people who don't like the film. Now, another quote. Hellcoat seems both enshrouded in the darkness and possessed by it. The ambiguity is that we don't know whether he is in control of his environment or if this environment is controlling him. Hicks frames the action in close-up shots, urging us to identify with his protagonist. Now, um, a couple of things there. Australian films, oh, they love a bit of close-up. They love a bit of close-up. And uh, the film starts, first shot of the film, extreme close-up, Jeffrey Rush talking, just talking in riddles as the credits roll over Jeffrey's face. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's just really about getting, getting inside the head of Jeffrey Rush. And think about that. Uh, think about other films that have used extreme close-ups. There's been a number of them in this film. Because it's really about the performance. And the film is saying to us right from the start, this is not a film about anything apart from the performance. But another part of the quote that I'm interested in talking to you about right now, ladies and gentlemen, is um, this bit. The ambiguity is that we don't know whether he is in control of his environment or if this environment is controlling him. You know what you could apply that quote to? Every Australian film ever! That's right. Australian films, it's all about the environment. Are we controlling the environment? Is one controlling us? You know? Um, there's a, a, you know, a, a shonky kind of Australian horror called The Long Weekend. Couple go away. Treat the environment very badly. You know, throwing beer cans, you know, at trees and flicking cigarette butts everywhere and things like that. And then the environment turn against the characters. Literally. But, um, I mean, you see it in all Australian films. Picnic and Hanging Rock. The Rock. Evil Angels. Dingoes. Part of the environment. The Babadook. Where's that Babadook coming from? You know what I'm saying? It's all there. Um, in the environment. And the environment... Uh, a character's not being able to control the environment. And once characters accept that they can't control the environment, they're okay with it. Um, there's a, you know, the Australian film, um, uh, The Proposition, John Hillcote, where Ray Winston says at the start of that film, I will civilise, uh, you know, this place. He uses the word civilise. And he's he never, of course, civilises uh, the landscape. But um, I thought that was interesting, the way that, you know, foreign critics often make these observations about Australian films, but, um, you, you know, they're actually true of all Australian films. Okay. Uh, more quotes. I'm loving my quotes today. Much of the rest of Shine tends to revert to a more simplistic cinematic form. 
Hicks's aesthetic consists of treating almost every image as if it were a postcard contrived to please the mesmerised eye with the superficial beauty of any scene or filmed event. The result is often at an unvarying tone dictated by the mundane pettiness of every shot. Hicks consistently films Healthcote with a dubious cinematic awe. Whether the pianist is speeding towards a breakdown or rising above the traumas of him. Now, uh, I want you to have a think about how the locations are being used. I mean, we've been discussing a lot um, about locations regarding the films that we've been seeing. We've got uh, scenes set in Adelaide. We've got scenes set in London. Think about the juxtaposition between the two. Think about the different David Healthcoats, the way that he is represented across the two, the true two landscapes. Um, you know, which is you know David in London is very kind of aspirational, very ambitious. He wants to go places, and then of course you've got the older David, um, who's a very different sort of David. Think about Ben Goldsmith's quote here, rather than understanding Australian cinema as a territory, Australian international cinema is conceived as a space of relations, and those spaces of relations are often visual landscape spaces where back and forth. Think about other films that we've been seeing, which is actually between and back and forth different locations and different spaces. Um, you know, Balibo is a really good example. The Sapphires is a really good example. You know, films that are back and forth. This is one of those films. All right, so have a think about that. Um, why cast two Davids? Like, why not just have Jeffrey Rush play um, a younger David Heldcote? Apart from the fact that Jeffrey Rush, you know, you're not gonna you're not gonna convince anyone if you if you cast him as an 18 year old um, David Heldcote. It's not gonna happen. Yeah. Um, now, I, I think you know what the film's really trying to do is trying to say that you know there are two Davids going on here. And, you know, although they're the same character, they're two different sides of the character. And, you know, um, I think it's, it's kind of interesting what's actually going on. Now, our, our good friend Julian Lampoint from Film Quarterly, he, oh, he's not happy. He's not happy with anything, Julian. Um, Jeffrey Rush's Oscar-winning acting is skilled, but it lacks sensitivity, stuttering frenetically, his head bobbing constantly, his eyes gleeful, and his back and shoulders hunched in a humble and unassuming pose. He presents a series of mechanical gestures, all executed rather duly and dispassionately. The uncanny technique, running a little dry on feelings. It isn't Russia's fault. Health coat has been conceived almost solely to win over our sympathies. The adult health coat, an emotionally crippled neurotic, still childlike and lost in fantasy, is made to look cute. He's adorably disconnected from... Reality. Um, well, I mean, firstly, it's a film about the performance. You know, it's a film, and it is. It's willfully trying to get a particular emotion from its audience. Now, you can, you're either with it or you're not with it, right? If you like the film, you're going to be with the David Heathcote character and the way that Jeffrey Rush portrays that character. If you don't like the film, you're going to use those same reasons as reasons why you don't like the film, okay? Now, um, I think what's important to establish is that David Healthcote's family were against the film. They didn't like the film. They didn't think it was an accurate film. They didn't think it was an ethical film. They thought the way the father was depicted, well, you know, he was essentially demonized in the film, like he's a real prick in the film, and they were saying that is simply not true. David had um, mental health problems across his career, and his father did absolutely everything to support and to help him and to support and help his love and his obsession with music. Um, and the sister who'd written a book, she wasn't consulted at all. They weren't happy. So I think it's it's worth thinking about um, that ethically, what's going on in the film. A couple of final thoughts, how to shine establish its actors as character actors. When you think of Australian films, you're constantly thinking of... Um, we're not all all actors, you know. There are some like uh, Nicole Kidman, Rusty Crowe, who become big stars in and of their own right. But a lot of Australian actors who make it big overseas, they're essentially character actors. You know, whether it's your Sam Neills or it's your um, Tony Collette, 
right? You know, who plays Muriel's wedding, but she's kind of constantly being recast in that a similar role like that in different films. Um, and then you've got Jeffrey Rush and Noah Taylor from this film, where they will kind of be established more as character actors. And even when Jeffrey Rush plays a a, uh, a leading role, he's kind of more known. You know, he's kind of playing his kind of quirky character sort of actors. How does the film compare to other true story films uh, that you've seen? How is truth limited to the characters portrayed? And what I mean by that is it's not an event film. It's not a true story film about an event. It's a true story about a character. So it's trying to get the truth of the character, the facilimitude, if you want to use that term, of the character. How are the locations used? Think Adelaide, think London, right? Think the contrast between the two. What resonance does the film have in Australia of as an Australian film? Right? How does the film resonate with you as an Australian film? Other films we see in the course. How is this film a film about outsiders? Right? Like all the films we're seeing, it's somehow about outsiders. Um, this film, you got characters out or the character of David Healthcare, outside the mainstream, outside Ocker, Australia. Where are the Ockers in this film, ladies and gentlemen? And outside Australia, literally film back and forth. Think of films like Balabone, like The Sapphires, which are essentially about films back and forth between Australia and abroad. And also, I want to have a good conversation about um, how the how uh, how uh, child abuse and mental health is depicted in this film. It's something that Australian films are quite um, open to exploring. Certainly, mental health. And uh, it's not a film about child abuse, obviously. It's not a film about mental health. But they are very much part of the world that's being depicted here. And if the family are true, which is that Jeffrey... W I'm Jeffrey. <laughs> See, I'm so convinced that Jeffrey Rush is David Healthcote. I'm calling David Jeffrey. Right? The family were, were so adamant that, you know, David was never abused by his father mentally. Right? But yet, you know, he had this inside him that was just going to manifest itself in some form or another. So uh, good to have some conversations around that and how you think the film is depicting that and whether you think the film, you know, pushes that idea too far of demonising the father. All right, I'm going to leave it there. I think Shine, terrific film, still holds up tremendously well. Jeffrey Rush, best work he's ever done. There, I've said it. And... Uh, you know, he's done some good work since, but this is just absolutely killing it. So, uh, well done you, Jeffrey Rush. And uh, leave it there. Speak to you soon. Bye for now.